figured I will, I will get a cobbler's job as a software engineer and I will do physics on the side. And I did uh, end up working for Penn State for eight years. I was teaching software engineering and got up to the associate professor rank. But uh, you know, I didn't have to do physics research there. <laughs> so I kept doing this uh, you know, at my home, basically. And yes, you know, I don't need to tell you, but you know, academic uh, attitude towards uh, weird stuff. They don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole because they're afraid to lose prestige or you know, being ridiculed. And in my mind, this is crazy because, you know, weird stuff is what we need to investigate. This is like the most interesting stuff. So to, in order to, to get into it, you know, you cannot be in academia because it's, it's frowned upon. So, uh, you know, I was tinkering at home with a, a variety of experiments that I found interesting. And at some point I stumbled, stumbled upon uh, cavitation. And uh, of course, you know, work by Tali Yarkan seemed interesting and uh, all of the papers that, that followed and all of the other papers that were by Lipson and Biturian that were more in the uh, LENR realm rather than in mainstream physics realm. But all of that you know, indicated that maybe fusion can happen when you cavitate. And what I liked about the work of Teleyarkan is because it was mainstream. You know, I didn't rely on any uh, obscure physics and I didn't uh, need any new physics, um, relied on understood uh, thermonuclear fusion. So it sounded like, well, I mean, if at least we can understand the process, maybe we can uh, you know, get it to work. And that's when I launched uh, my company, I think it was year 2010, uh, Quantum Potential Corporation at the time. And you know, I wanted to, to raise money to pursue nuclear fusion research uh, <laughs> as a business. But you know, little did I know that uh, capitalists don't fund ideas, you know, founders fund ideas. And you know, once you have a product, you can raise capital for uh, product development. But at the time, I was naive. So myself and my friends, you know, we put some money together and chased bubble fusion for about a year. And quickly ran out of money. Realized, well, in order to sustain the business, we have to do something practical. So we switched from cavitating, you know, deuterium <laughs> bubbles to cavitating, you know, crude oil in order to develop some technology for the oil industry. You know, which I did develop successfully, but the point is I wasn't doing any bubble fusion work. <laughs> so after that business, uh, uh, you know, I moved to Florida and all of a sudden I had a bunch of free time on my hands. <laughs> and I thought, well, why don't I go back to bubble fusion because, and I always wanted to do it. And now I have time and I have a lot more knowledge. So uh, the, uh, I know how I ended up uh, was bubble fusion. At first I started doing just uh, experimental physics from, uh, from scratch. You know, I've never done it by myself and it was just me. So, you know, how do you start something? You, you learn it. So I started working with x-rays and I replicated one denarian experiment and I worked on stern glass experiment. And as I, as I was doing it, I was learning, you know, everything I need to learn about, uh, you know, how to do experimental physics. So how to run a vacuum pump, how to degas a vacuum system. You know, how to do mass spectrometry, you know, with the residual gas analyzer, you know, how, how to do radiation detection. And that was the time when I realized that, you know, most people use radiation detection techniques that are so old, like out of 60s, and are so prone to errors. And I thought, no way, like in the 21st centuries, we're going to use like NIMBIN racks <laughs> that are like 50 pounds heavy and, you know, have, have a bunch of patch wires. It's almost like steampunk. So I developed my own, uh, you know, radiation detection methodology that deals with x-ray gamma and neutrons. And I started building my own detectors, you know, fitted with touch, <laughs> touch screen displays and, you know, modern electronics, uh, you know, fully integrated uh, networkable, uh, you know, so you could acquire a lot of data easily. And I spent like really a lot of time learning, you know, how to measure because uh, if we want to get to the bottom of truth in any uh, experimental uh, setup, First thing, first, we have to know how the measurement devices work. You know, how they can be affected by experimental conditions, how can they be affected by environment, what the sources of systematic errors, uh, you know, what does the signal look like? What does the good signal look like? What does the bad signal look like? Because uh, unbelievably, there are so many papers when, you know, people, you know, for the sake of argument, take a voltmeter, you know, plug it in and get a weird reading and say, oh, you know, 
my device is generating you know, a kilowatt of power because this voltmeter shows you know thousand volts. <laughs> well, you know it's never as simple as that. You know you need to capture signal, you need to exclude interference, and you know in many ways it's a boring word, but it's necessary because without you know being certain about your measurements, you know you cannot get anywhere. So I spent you know two or three years perfecting neutron detection techniques, and I realized that when I was doing bubble fusion back then, you know, 10 years ago, I, it was completely wrong because I knew nothing about neutron detection. I relied on third party advice. Ironically, I went to Penn State professors and asked them you know, uh, to measure neutrons. And the advice they gave me was just terrible. <laughs> so, you know, the point is in order to, to succeed, you kind of need to know all the steps of the process, right? If you're building a reactor, you need to know about radiation detection, you need to know about vacuum systems, you need to know about the thermonuclear processes. So if you know all the steps, then there is some hopes that you know, if you oversee the project, you can make sure that every step is done right. But if you rely on, on somebody else's expertise, you never know whether you know, they're just bullshitting you or not taking you know, your work seriously. So that was my revelation. You know, nobody took my work seriously. So the advice the lent was either half-assed or <laughs> wrong. And it wasn't even about money. You pay people, they still you know, give you bad advice. So, so I'm glad I spent all this time in, in learning everything and I found myself in a position, well, you know, I can do it entirely by myself. You know, my background is in ultrasonics and cavitation is part of, of, of the university diploma I've gotten. So I understand that pretty well. You know, I'm pretty good with computers. I can write my own software. I understand radiation detection. I've learned now about vacuum systems. So how about I get back to the bubble fusion because it feels to me now that I have all of the background I need in a package in one person. So nothing will be lost in translation. I can't just do it. So and exactly, you know, one year ago, I started this project in earnest. And of course, when you start something, you know, by yourself, you figure out, you know, how can I do it on a budget, right? Because whatever time I can spend. So I got and bought all of the all, all of, of the shelf components. I figured there is no need to commission any complex engineering you know, to anybody, you know, spend hundreds of thousand dollars on complex machinery, complex computations, how, how about I just buy, you know, an off the shelf like Branson Sonifier, like you see here. And thank God for eBay, because you know, everything is cheap on eBay. You can buy amazing equipment. And, and another thing I learned is, you know, if you, if you invest a little bit of time on learning how equipment works, you can fix a lot of it. So something worth $100,000, no way, you know, an independent researcher can afford it, not easily anyway. So you buy something, you know, for a thousand bucks that's broken, but because you know how it works, you can fix it. So that's how I was able, you know, to put, you know, millions of dollars of scientific equipment uh, for, you know, one, one percent of the real values because, you know, buy stuff, I fix it. And, you know, granted, occasionally you need to call in, you know, the company that made it and say, hey, you know, I need a technician. And, they, and, and you have to pay, you know, a pretty penny for it, but, you know, the technician comes in and they calibrate the system. And still, you know, for a price, a technician, you get a hundred thousand dollar system like the one I have here for measuring, you know, bubble size distribution. So it's a Sympatec PLS laser that shoots a laser beam through the uh, fluid and can tell you the bubble size down to hundred nanometer range. So that's, you know, I'm immensely proud <laughs> by, by being able you know, to fix that system and get it calibrated to factory spec, you know, and I didn't spend a hundred thousand on it. So the point is, you know, I had all of the experience I wanted, and I, you know, got all of the shelf, all of the shelf components, and some fixed, uh, you know, some I had technicians fix, and started putting a system together, without really, uh, oh, you know, I need to start out a plan. I had an overall plan. I didn't have a detailed plan because, you know, the experience shows when you start, no matter how much time you put into thinking, and there is something that you discover that <laughs> you haven't thought of. So I started with a very simple setup. Yeah, it's still, you can kind of see it here. So this is a Branson Sonifier sealed atmospheric chamber with a horn mounted on it, you know, connected to the power <laughs> supply. So when you energize it, it produces a massive cavitation, you know, like uh, ear piercing cavitation. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll try uh, cavitating oil. So my idea was I will take oil, low vapor pressure oil, I will mix it with deuterium to create deuterium bubbles. and I will cavitate it as hard as I, as I could and see if, uh, because there are a bunch of bubbles, maybe some of them will collapse you know, in just the right way and give me thermonuclear 
fusion reactions. So to detect neutrons, I've uh, put together a bank of neutron detectors. So these are old uh, Soviet, you know, helium three tubes, you know, that I buy in mass quantities because a lot of them don't work. <laughs> but if you buy a hundred, you can find, you know, ten or twenty that are good. <laughs> and because I'm expert in neutron detection, I was able to calibrate them, you know, make sure they produce the proper signal. And that's a lot of them. You know, most researchers would have one. You know, I have twenty, so my sensitivity is twenty times. And then, you know, I could use borax, like you see here. And you can shield uh, environmental neutrons. So environment is full of neutrons that nobody really knows where they come from. So the theory is they originate in cosmic rays. Maybe, maybe so. But the funny thing is that flux is not uniform. And even though you register on average like five neutrons per minute with a typical tube, it could be one, it could be 10, it could be 20. So depending on what you know, Cosmos is doing, you can have like weird spikes. And that's another like pitfall a lot of people fall into. They do something, they stick a neutron detector and they register this signal. And they say, oh, you know, something happened. But it's just the environment, you know, playing tricks of you on you. So you need to always collect your background in order to determine, you know, do you get spikes? And lo and behold, you do, you know, some supernova blows somewhere. <laughs> shoots a bunch of cosmic rays at Earth, you got, you got a spike, or even, you know, thunderstorms. So, so the point is, you know, you need to do statistical analysis. So you need to know the distribution of your background, you need to, to capture the distribution of counts from your experiment, and you need to do statistical comparison in order to determine, you know, whether your result is significant or not. And, you know, one thing I've learned, if you do an experiment once or twice or three times, you can get any result. And then you cannot make any sense of it because you can never tell whether a cosmic flu or, you know, did something happen in the experimental setup, you just don't know. Because, you know, by some random chance, you can get, you know, weird signal because, you know, environment is active. It's not like a passive environment that we live in. So that's why I was running experiment after experiment after experiment, day after day after day after day, you know, thousands, you know, trying to make sense of what my readings are. And, uh, you know, I was getting some interesting signals where it looked like when I cavitate, my signal was statistically significant, you know, just above background. And then, you know, because I repeated it like 100 times and every time it was a little bit over background, you know, I could make a statistical argument saying, well, <laughs> if I ca calculate the p-value, it, it means that chances of getting, you know, these counts when the cavitation is on is like one in a billion. But you know, still the signal was very small and I was thinking, you know, how can I boost it? So I decided to invest a bit of time and you know, build a bigger system that you see here. So it's made out of uh, vacuum components. Let me see so I can see what you see. All right, so it uses a vacuum, six inch vacuum T and that's the system that holds my working fluid. It holds a uh, low vapor pressure oil. And here in the back of it, you can see a bank of neutron detectors. So I quit using Russian <laughs> detectors and I broke the bank and bought, you know, good American you know, neutron detectors that are not flaky <laughs> and are not, you know, 40 year, years old. And uh, this whole system is hooked up to a vacuum pump because about, uh, you know, the first thing that you need to do is you need to degas your fluid because, you know, fluids uh, dissolve a lot of gases, a lot of air, you know, a lot of contaminants and, if you want to achieve nuclear fusion, you cannot afford to have a bunch of stuff you don't want, you know, in your bubbles or in your, you know, plasma or whatever. So, you know, below it, I spent uh, like a month or two trying to figure out how would I degas the well? How would I heat it? How would I pump it such it doesn't boil? Um, you know, how would I cavitate it without it exploding? Because in a couple of times it would get like super critical and explode and, of course, oil would get into the pump, into my vacuum gauge is like ruining everything. So my entire uh, lab here is covered in oil. Everything is in oil. <laughs> Even my paint and my screen is in oil. You know, it's, you forget <laughs> to close a valve. You know, my cat is in oil. <laughs> and, you know, because it's low vapor pressure, it's hard to, to clean. It's not exactly like goo, but, you know, it, it doesn't absorb. <laughs> it just stays there. 
but you know it's it's the nature of the thing you know you just keep doing it and you know every day i clean something because i find a spot that, that i missed or of course if you take something apart it starts licking you know and everywhere you know there is spots but you know that's kind of what i have to do so i built this uh, larger reactor and i've learned well i need to degas the oil because if the oil is not well degassed the sound that i get is weak and you know the bubbles as they expand they fill up with the gas that's dissolved so once I learned, you know, how to dissolve, uh, how to degas the oil, I started introducing deuterium, you know, from an lecture bottle. So that's, you know, one of the lecture bottles that I got. So interesting, uh, fun fact, uh, you know, before this runaway inflation, this was like, you know, 300 bucks and 100 bucks to ship. <laughs> now it's like 450 bucks and 150 bucks to ship, you know, just six months, you know, down the road, like, God damn it. But, you know, you, you need deuterium, right? You know, Otherwise, what, what, what would you use? So I introduced deuterium into my system, you know, through this leak valve here. And right now a different bottle is connected to it, you know, xenon bottle. I run out of deuterium, unfortunately, so I'm waiting a new bottle. So you introduce deuterium and then uh, I need to create bubbles and you begin to wonder, you know, how would you make a bubble? So I tried a number of techniques. I tried uh, like Venturi. So here is a Venturi nozzle. Maybe you can see it. A brass part there. It's connected to the headspace of the reactor. So when a fluid goes through Venturi, pressure drops and gases dissolve and bubbles form. But then you know you need to know are they big, are they small, what is your bubble size distribution? So that that's why I had to put together that laser system that uh, can take a side stream of oil from the reactor. So go through the measuring uh, cell. So laser beam scatter of bubbles, I, I get a bubble size distribution. So I played like for many days trying to get, you know, the bubble size in the range that I wanted. And that's where, you know, the theory is important. So initially I said that, you know, I did some thinking, but not a lot of thinking. Well, I, maybe it was an understatement. I did, you know, a lot of thinking, <laughs> but I really need to do a lot more thinking. So it's very important to know how bubbles expand and collapse. And although in equations are published, you know, there are a bunch of assumptions on, on that expansion and collapse. For example, you know, there is an assumption that gases don't, you know, diffuse into the bubble. You know, that's not true. You know, gases do diffuse into the bubble when the bubble expands and you get, you know, what is known as rectified diffusion. So your bubbles become larger. So that's why I had to degas. And then, you know, when your bubble collapse, so once again, you know, the assumption is, oh, you know, gases don't diffuse away from the bubble. Well, that's not true either. So strictly speaking, in order to get like a good model of what's going on, you need to invest a lot of time into software modeling. And I even attempted to use, you know, Heidi's system that's a thermo uh, fluid dynamics uh, simulation package that inertial confinement scientists use. And that you know, software was used for even you know for cavitation bubble collapse uh, simulation in conjunction with nuclear fusion. So I found you know people who who's done that work and asked them you know how did they run their simulation, and it's it's anything but easy. Point being you know when the bubbles collapse, the whole you know mathematical equation looks like a singularity. <laughs> You essentially, you know, divide by zero, and it's very difficult for a numerical package not to crash. So, you know, to this day, you know, I wasn't able to, you know, come up with a set of uh, switches and, and tricks and techniques to get it to simulate without a crash. You know, other people have done it, but, you know, once you jump through, through this many hoops, you begin to wonder, was it just a fix to where it didn't crash, or, you know, was it accurately from the physical standpoint of view? So I decided not to pursue this further because it sounds like a full-time job for a PhD student that has to spend you know, time just on, on mathematical model and making sure that it's consistent, that you know, it includes all of the physics. And even then, you know, you're not sure <laughs> if, if it's correct. So, so, so Max, it, Max mm -hmm. don't mean to uh, block your flow, but so what was the purpose of looking at the bubble size? Is it to look at the pressure uh, that was created? The, the, I needed a theory of what the bubble size I need. So an important point here, everybody was going towards hard, harder pressures. And if you open up a literature, they say, oh, you need you know, 10 bars, 100 bars, you know, 1,000 bars of pressure, 10,000 bars. So the idea, bigger is better. Because they, so they've I, done a study that they presented at ICCF 22 on the bubble size 
relating to the actual uh, pressure created by the collapse of the bubble. Right, right. And, and the general point was we need to go towards high, harder pressures. And I decided to do the contrary. I decided to go towards lower pressures and smaller bubbles because if you have a very small like 100 nanometer bubble when it expands, uh, and you can, it can expand it to a millimeter size. And inside that bubble, what you get is essentially high grade vacuum. And when that bubble collapses, the energy concentration is far greater than when you had a large bubble and, and you drive it by a large pressure. That's because, basically uh, what they said at ICCF 22. You want to target smaller and smaller bubbles. Yeah. Right. And that's the approach I chose, you know, going towards smaller bubbles. So that's why it was important to measure the bubble size distribution to see if, in fact, they get, you know, those small bubbles. Because uh, experiments with large pressure weren't successful. You know, people went up to a thousand bars, you know, like impulse devices or burst technologies with a commercial venture that pursued bubble fusion commercially without success. And their objective was, well, let's max the pressure. So it never works because, you know, some kind of instability during the final stage of collapse, you know, ruins everything. So I said, okay, well, how about I just, I just do less and less matter. So, you know, once I was satisfied with the, you know, bubble size distribution, you know, I was circulating the oil, I was cavitating, you know, I wasn't getting a big signal. So like, you know, what am I missing? So out of uh, almost like sheer desperation, I decided to add a little bit of uh, deuterated deuterium oxide or heavy water, you know, to my oil and see if, uh, if I emulsify it, because that's what happens. When you cavitate a mixture of water and oil, you get an emulsion. And the longer you cavitate it, the uh, finer the emulsion becomes. And almost instantly, you know, I started seeing, you know, neutron counts above background to such an extent I've never seen before. So mm -hmm. to give you an example, if my background is like five neutrons per minute on average, maybe during my experiment, I would get six. And then, you know, I would use statistics to show, oh, you know, over 10 experiments that, you know, six counts per minute average is statistically greater than five, you know, counts per minute average. Uh, that I get from background. So I had to use statistical arguments, you know, and that's why, you know, I kept quiet about my results because if I tell somebody, well, you know, I got just one extra neutron, I, I wasn't even sure it was real. But, you know, as soon as I added, uh, you know, heavy water, I started getting counts uh, like 1500 CPM. Oh, okay. Well, okay, hold on a minute. So. So do you think that the, the counts that you're originally getting were just some uh, uh, residual deuterium oxide in, that was in the uh, oil? I don't know. And that's uh, kind of one disclaimer. What, what, is, the, what is the elements consist in the oil? Is it like a silicon-based oil or what? No, it's just mineral oil. It's maybe good old you know, hydrocarbon oil. It's multi-therm okay. IG4, if you want to know. Right, OK. So, so it does have some deuterium naturally. And, you know, I was introducing deuterium in the form of bubbles, but, you know, it wasn't doing anything like significant. And for that matter, when I tried cavitating just in the heavy water, you know, just for the heck of it, because I have so many nutrient detectors, I wasn't so just, getting it. Just to clarify, you were adding deuterium gas, but because you ran out of deuterium gas, you thought, oh, well, let's, let's try the emulsification of uh, heavy water. So we, we, you've actually got protons and uh, uh, but in the case of, of the, the heavy water these are deuterons and oxygen so when you had just deuterium you had d2 molecules in there when you right. add heavy water you've got oxygen and deuterium carry on this is very very important what you've done there right and in fact uh, at that point there was a lot of stuff in my reactor because you know i was trying a bunch of things and you know nothing was quite working so I even had, you know, traces of xenon, you know, because someone else, you know, published a paper that addition of xenon improves shockwave. So I had traces of xenon, traces of deuterium, and then I added, you know, heavy water and my counts started like off the chart, 1500 CPM. And you know, to the point that I got scared, you know, because I worked with x-rays before. Yeah. I was joking that, you know, I don't have any here. I don't know how much it affected me. <laughs> so, so stop again. Is is that um, uh, the actual real counts, or is that your calculated counts on? No, that's actual counts I was getting. You know, 
And okay, so, so how, if you spread yeah. that out to the entire uh, uh, spherical volume, how much would that relate to that is coming out of the device? Probably in excess of 10,000 pounds per minute. That's, that's scary. You want to keep your distance from that, mate. <laughs> well, on. You know, when, when, I, when I saw that, I got scared. You know, I stopped the experiment. You know, I took a break. And then I started methodically seeing you know, if there is a flaw somewhere, you know, because you can get counts if you get like electrical interference. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was the reason I was capturing the raw trace from the detector so I could take a look and see, you know, what does my signal look like? And, you know, much to my astonishment, the signal looked good. You know, I saw typical, you know, negative dips on the signal that correspond to neutrons and just a lot of them. There was another like fortuitous uh, thing that happened. Um, the noise, the cavitation noise from the uh, Branson sonifier, you know, from this guy, because mm -hmm. it's such a powerful uh, power supply. So a bit of that noise found its way into the uh, detector signal, but it was below the threshold. So when you detect neutrons, you know, you look for pulses that are below like or above like a certain magnitude. So in order to reject gamma rays and noise, you know, I set up uh, the rejection level at like three millivolts. And uh, the noise from Branson was on the order of like one or two millivolts, but you could see those batches of noise on the trace. So when the cavitation is on, power supply is on, you'll see this like, oscillation, you know, within one to two uh, millivolt range. And almost all of my neutron pulses were coincident, you know, with that, with that event. So every time the sound was on, you know, neutrons come and burst. And when the sound is off, there are no neutrons. So I saw a correlation between uh, cavitation and neutrons. And of course, in my case, that's what you want to see. You want to say, you know, when I cavitate, I get neutrons. When I don't cavitate, I don't. So that's what I saw. Uh, but it was September of last year, and I kind of ran up to a deadline where I had to quit this work, and you know we had to do some other <laughs> stuff. Like my son was getting married, you know, <laughs> among other things. So I had to take a break, uh, you know, from this work for a few months. So I left everything as it was, and you know I didn't find any uh, problems with my detector. So the tech detectors uh, looked fine. So the signal was fine. Uh, it wasn't electrical interference, the detectors work properly, you know, they responded to my calibration source properly. So I didn't see any obvious problems. So I just, you know, left it and I figured I'll get back to it in January, you know, once <laughs> all of the other work that I, you know, keep <laughs> pushing back throughout the year, you know, piled up and I had to clear it. So I cleared that backlog in January. So last month, you know, I get back to my reactor, I powered up and I still get, you know, the signal. It wasn't like in the 1500 CPM before, it was on the order of, you know, 10 or 20 CPM, but it's still, you know, almost like 20 times background that I was getting. So I thought, okay, you know, I don't trust this Russian detectors. So I took them off and put those American detectors in that were, you know, much newer, you know, much higher quality. <laughs> and I still get, you know, the same signal. Uh, in, in the counts per minute, it, it wasn't like uh, a thousand because you know, those detectors are smaller. And I also used a borax behind the reactor to shield my background. So my background now is uh, like below one count per minute. It's like over five minutes, maybe I get one or two background neutrons. And to make sure that's the case, I ran like for 24 hours and I've never seen more than three counts per minute out of that detector bank, no matter how, how long I run it on the background. But when I fire up you know, the reactor, I get you know, 20 or 30 counts per minute. So, you know, 10 times uh, above the background. So that gave me, you know, gradually gave me confidence that, you know, the signal I see is real. And I thought, well, maybe a vibration affects the detector somehow. So I used some foam padding, you know, to wrap around, make sure the sound is absorbed and didn't, didn't change anything. So I tried everything and anything, you know, I could, you know, I don't see a problem with the detector. So the signal, you know, Seems genuine. These detectors are newer, so you cannot say, "Oh, it's all you know Russian crap." You know, you cannot trust. So I get the uh, raw signal, and uh, so that that's where I thought, well, I don't know if this is fusion because in order to prove fusion, you actually need to look for tritium, or you need to look at the uh, energy spectrum, you know, of of the neutrons and say, well, it matches the you know deuterium deuterium fusion reaction. But I, but I surely looks like you know get a neutron signal it could come from spallation you know spallation is a known effect where you can strip neutrons out of carbon or nitrogen so that might be the source i don't know but 
what's important is almost every time, you know, I, when I fire up the system, I get the signal. And by saying almost, uh, you know, I don't know yet what is important because that result was unexpected. As I said, my system wasn't particularly clean and uh, I ran out of deuterium. <laughs> so I had to order a new bottle. So I'm waiting for it to, to come in and I want to run a clean test where I will evacuate the system, you know, clean it, you know, put a fresh charger oil, you know, create fresh bubbles, put a fresh pitcher of, you know, of deuterium oxide in it and kind of go from scratch and report everything that I've done precisely and see if it can basically replicate my own result by, you know, doing everything anew. So what I was doing in this past, you know, few days as my deuterium ran out, you know, I was pumping on the system and as deuterium was leaving my system, you know, I quit getting neutrons. So I'm now at a point where I pumped it long enough and I introduced like other gases like xenon and I'm not, I'm not getting any neutrons. And, and this decline was gradual. And, and to me, that's another match of expectation. So if uh, I wanna create a deuterium, deuterium thermonuclear fusion, if there is no deuterium, you know, I shouldn't be getting any fusion. So it's not just deuterium oxide. It appears to be a, a mixture of emulsion and you know, some dissolved deuterium gas that, that makes it work. And uh, another interesting thing is, is uh, when I introduced the emulsion, the, uh, the sound, the cavitation sound became a lot stronger. So when I look at the trace, I see pulses that pretty much saturate the uh, piezoelectric transducer that measures um, the intensity of cavitation. And just to give you a perspective, a typical uh, sine wave that I use is uh, 40, millivolt and amplitude when I, when I record it. And this means 40 PSI, one millivolt is in one PSI according to the PCB transducer that I use. And that's, you know, just three, you know, three and a half, uh, not even three and a half, just three, let's say three atmospheres. So it's uh, in a fairly moderate drive. But uh, when I introduce the emulsion, I start getting peaks that are like 15 volts and 15 volts would be in a 15,000 PSI. And, and they just clip of that, so that's the saturated transducer. So it's pretty strong uh, cavitation. It was so intense that the uh, glass window that I had on the reactor cracked at one point. Now I use a blank, so I don't see what's going on. But you know, clearly the emulsion increased you know, the power of sound, but you know, I still need to have some deuterium vapor dissolved you know, for the magic to work. And that's on my to-do list you know, for the next you know, few days, weeks, months. Once the deuterium arrives, I will try to recreate all of the steps and figure out which steps were essential and which steps were not in order to, to have a very succinct you know, prescription. Okay, well, this is what you do. And this is the signal you're gonna get as a result. And once I'm at that stage, I can start researching the physics of the process. So is this thermonuclear fusion? So I'm gonna look for tritium. Or if this is spallation, you know, we'll look for gamma spectrum and see if it's consistent. Uh, with spallations, I haven't done that because you know this result came a bit unexpectedly. So, so a lot of things I still need to do. But the other fact that I'm going to mention, uh, you know, also out of you know sheer desperation, I added some um, titanium deuteride to my um, oil emulsion, and and with that I was also getting you know, neutron flux that was in a way above background but it had a peculiar feature to it. Once I stopped the cavitation, it would not return to baseline, to background right instantly, because that's what you expect. You know, you kill the sound, no thermonuclear fusion. Instead, I saw a gradual decline, like on the order of 10 minutes. And I'm a little cynical. So before, you know, when I read somebody else's paper and they say, oh, we have an after effect. I say, you know, these assholes don't know how to measure, you know, they, they capture noise. I didn't believe in after effects, but now I'm seeing it, you know, myself when a little bit of uh, titanium deuteride powder is present. And I've done it like a number of times. I turn cavitation on and I see the counts rise. I turn it off, you know, they fall, but gradually I turn it on and the same thing repeats. So there is a clear correlation between, you know, what I'm doing and what I'm seeing. So I cannot, you know, refute it as an experimental fluke. Besides, you know, I record the signal. I know what the signal looks like. You know, it's not noise. And it, I've seen it so many times to where it's a genuine phenomenon. So if trace contamination of titanium deuteride is present, 
counts do not return to baseline instantly. Instead, they take maybe 10, 10 minutes to decay. So I would have 20 counts per minute and it will take you know, 20 minutes to return to one count per minute and stay at that level. And then you know, if I capture for 20 hours, I get this you know, random noise background where it goes between zero and three counts per minute. But I turn on the cavitation, it rises to 20 counts per minute. I turn it off and my expectation should go to one count per minute or two or three instantly. But no, it takes you know, 15 minutes to come back. Like, you know, what the hell is going on there? You know, I have no idea. So I can only speculate, but as a good experimenter, I just, you know, record my observations and record the conditions. And I intend, you know, to look at them closer, you know, once my deuterium arrives and once I install additional spectrometers, gamma and X-ray spectrometers and so into my system to capture additional data. So this year is promising to be very exciting in the sense that I have a signal that you know I can replicate now, I need to figure out what it means. So I cannot you know yet submit a paper to physical review letters and say, hey, you know I have thermonuclear fusion going on. The best I can say, I have a signal, a neutron signal that's coincident with cavitation, and I need to work more on it in order to determine you know what's the origin of it. And you know that's exactly what I intend to do. So any questions? Uh, well, uh, I, I have a lot of comments uh, and, and directional things that I can offer you, but I'm, I'm going to go and get something that's over there, and I will encourage people first in the room uh, to maybe ask Max uh, or, or uh, have a conversation with Max, and then I'll come in with my comments and, and maybe some potential directions from my experience where I think you can go. Okay, so... Uh, far away, if you want to raise your hand, if you go down to the bottom, there's an option to say reactions, and then you can say raise hand, and I can then invite you in to speak. So if anyone wants to ask questions. Oh, and uh, just to conclude, I, I put my observations in a report. Um, so I wrote a preliminary report of 15 pages where I provide all of the signals and all of the counts and describe my protocol and measurement set up in you know, the best I could. And I uploaded it to my website, maximus.energy. There is a blog post there, it says bubble fusion, uh, neutrons detected, you know, question marks. And there is a link to that PDF report that contains all of the, you know, details that, you know, I haven't included. And uh, of course I'm interested in, in hearing, you know, feedback and criticism, or maybe I miss this or that, or maybe I should do this on that. And that report also outlines my next steps. So I, you know, I read it myself. I, I see where my weaknesses are. So I said, okay, well, this is what I need to do next. And this is what I'm going to do, just haven't gotten to it. So does anyone uh, want to ask Max any questions? Anyone? Okay, oh, I've got one from Anders Herford. Uh, what is the address of Max's website? So can you put yeah, that? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. So here okay. is the... Uh, picture of the blog spot uh, blog post with the link to the report so can you all see it uh yes i can see it. it's it's to everyone so there's a link there and i, I will post that on the blog as well uh when i broadcast and, and re-upload this yeah. video later. It's a direct link to the report okay so and then uh we've got curtis e brecken he says regarding the emulsion of mineral oil and deuterium oxide is the mixture mainly mineral oil with the deuterium uh, yes, yes in the mineral oil uh, rough uh, and that's one other thing to do i need to start measuring you know how much oil and emulsion i'm admitting but that uh, reactor holds about you know a quart maybe two quarts of uh, multi-therm ig4 oil and maybe i added a, an ounce of um, heavy water. And I'll show you Hold on the bottle. That's, uh, can you see it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when you do experiments, it's kind of important that you cite the sources of your chemicals because you know, they all come in different purities. But that's like 99.99 point uh, 99.8 heavy water. So it's not you know, like high purity and about an ounce. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly oil. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Um, anyone else got any questions before I start blathering? <laughs> 
Okay, so on a, on a technical aspect, um, have it, how have you characterized the sound that's coming out? I mean, I know you've probably got a fundamental on your uh, piezo driver or whatever. You can turn on the sound for you, you can hear it for yourself. <laughs> So well, the sound is 20 kilohertz, all right? Okay, so that, that's, that's the, the main frequency, right? But you, yeah. Yeah, that's evil. I can tell that's going to be evil if I was in the room. That reactor. Right. I, we can't hear anything at all because the sound is so loud. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what I'd recommend you do, if you haven't got this, or maybe build yourself, because I know you're very competent, um, is uh, get hold of one of these. Um, so if my, maybe I, I highlight myself here. Um, how do I do that? Uh, maybe I can do that. There, okay. So this is an Ultramic. It's made from a guy in uh, Italy, and I think it's Ultramic. Uh, it's from Dodotronic, uh, like so, Dodotronic. And this is 384 kilohertz. And it has uh, settings in there where you it's just a USB device. And uh, I have a software that they have where you can you can download a software that can record at 384 kilohertz on an Android device, because I know you like to use that sort of thing. Um, and obviously, uh, you can you can analyze frequencies up to half of that 192 kilohertz. But this will give you a better understanding of what the modes are, particularly when you're adding gas and water and different levels of water in the emulsification at different stages in the process. So uh, you can maybe add that bit into your data. Uh, um, let, let me respond to that. I do have a piezoelectric transducer inside okay. my uh, reactor right now. So mm -hmm. that's the uh, lead and the transducer is suspended inside with an oil and it's PCB. Mm -hmm. and it's high frequency, so that's the preamp, and then I log the signal on this uh, tablet. So I uh, get a you know, pretty good idea of what my signal looks like by measuring uh, acoustics directly within the oil. Okay, is, is that just the intensity of the sound, or are you getting the spectrum? I can get everything, you know, both the intensity, so I get a time plot and I can get spectrum. Uh, and I'm thinking I probably need to deploy more than one because sound within the reactor is not uniform. Because mm -hmm. when I had the glass window, I could see that there was a standing wave that yeah. had nodes and antinodes. So right now the transducer is in random, random position. So right. I don't know the sound that it's picking up is uh, you know, representative or not. So I'm trying to figure out how to you know position it so I can you know capture a good like 3D make a 3D map of what the sound is like. But uh, fortunately, it's a high frequency transducer. So I can get you know, the intimate detail of the sound. And I did put some traces in the report that you know, show that you know, massive peaks that you know, develop sometimes. But uh, if the oil is well degassed, all you get is a sine wave. And that's what you kind of expect. You know? right. But yeah. once you start yeah. getting cavitation, you can see cavitation noise and uh, you know, once I started adding the emulsion, you know, I see these massive spikes that saturated the transducer, you know, that broke the glass. The viewport glass. Yeah, I got a new viewport, yeah, you know, just to show you. So that's the viewport that I, I yeah. got a replacement one. So I had uh, one exactly like it, and the glass broke because the cavitation was so intense. And I've never, you know, seen that happen before, but it did happen, you know, once I added the emulsion. So maybe the effect of emulsion is not so much that the fact that it's a DTO emulsion maybe it's just you know needs to create you know powerful sound wave and need to have this trace amount of deuterium to do the job. But go on. So I mean, uh, um, what we find uh, with the very simple ultra experiments we do using a, a thirty-five dollar um, domestic cleaner, ultrasonic cleaner, is that the the amount of water volume in there greatly changes the sound response uh, uh, because you're changing the resonant modes that are interacting with the oh, structure yeah. of the reactor as well. And you may, you may find that your reactor changes its capability just because you have one of your boxes of borax touching it. And so right. the resonant modes completely change in there. And it's, it's all about cymatics. It, 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 you have, it's like a lot of people know cymatics in a, in a 2D volume, but they don't think about it necessarily in a 3D volume. And so yep. just having a slightly lower level of oil in there or, or oil water emulsion or the actual fact that there's more bubbles in there will change 
the the resonant nodes in there. So um, it's a lot more complicated. I don't know whether you can maybe look through that window with some sort of scanning laser and and, yeah. and pulse it and get a, get a three D picture because in the ultra experiment, some some people have done this where they've got the water, a water column with an ultrasonic like cleaner horn and they put it in the top of the column. Uh, uh, so a, a guy in Holland has has done this. <laughs> And you can actually see these structures within the water volume, which are doing the coherence. Uh, and so, um, and where the, the most intense energy is, is put. So um, what's your plans with, with trying to map out what's going on in the, the volume of the fluid? Yeah, I mean, I really like your suggestion. I'm also thinking about, you know, deploying a camera so I could see what the hell is going on there at more or less decent resolution, because, you know, you're right. There are so many factors affected, and you know, right now I'm not controlling it or measuring it. Um, so your advice is valuable in this regard. If, if I mean, any you other play... ideas come later, you know, should because I am kind yeah, of struggling. But, yeah, that's fine. So we can talk this through. So um, when when uh, we, we're putting the aluminium foil or the other foil in there, you can immediately see where the nodes and the antinodes are, and all of the action, all of the transmutation happens in those figure of eight structures, these yin yang structures. But if you don't put the metal in there, sometimes you see these things spontaneously form within the 3D volume. I believe that this is where it, it's going on. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so if you look at the work of Stringham, who's probably one of the most experienced people right. in the field, uh, he found that if you use low frequency, you are getting all of the effects, right? But you get le less nodes and anti-nodes. It, it, they went to 1.7 megahertz from either 20 something uh, kilohertz or 40 something kilohertz. And you get obviously vastly more of the resonant nodes. And because it's resonant, sooner or later, they're going to get to the level of intensity where the action takes place. And so uh, when you're working, and, and I wouldn't even worry about working at 20 kilohertz because it's probably safer to parameterize everything at that level and then look at how it scales up because you're going to get less action maybe um with uh, but the energy concentration is more so uh, in in uh, mars's vibrator plates he's only vibrating those things at 169 hertz uh, and but on there you are getting resonant modes but because they're resonant they're then creating cavitation and then you're picking up the ultrasonics from the ca cavitation bubbles and the vibrations that they put out which may actually be influencing the process beyond that because you've got the cavitation sound adding on to the sound of of the uh, uh, input vibration as well and it's whether the two are interacting to produce the overall effect so it, it is much more complicated, but sound, in my view, is probably the simplest way to achieve these kind of transmutation or fusion or whatever is going on. Okay, so now you spoke right at the beginning of the presentation about Teliakin. Now, didn't, am I right in saying that he did some uh, uh, work in the US Naval Labs and, and they actually observed radiation there? Well, I guess, uh, here's what I know. He started at Oak Ridge. And so this right. is where he okay. got his first results. And frankly, his colleagues, so he, he left Oak Ridge and went to work for Purdue, Purdue, but his colleagues at Oak Ridge didn't believe his results. So they were one of the detractors. <clears throat> and when the BBC got involved and gave money to Putterman <laughs> to replicate Teleyarkin's work, uh, you know, Putterman was not able uh, to replicate it. And Teleyarkin said, well, that you know, replication wasn't accurate and maybe that may be true. But what is really disconcerting is uh, when Ross TCN started uh, Impulse Devices, he invited Teleyarkin to replicate his work at Impulse Devices, and Teleyarkin couldn't. So he traveled to California and you know built the setup, and they worked in, in earnest together. And despite that, you know they couldn't replicate. You know Teleyarkin couldn't replicate his own results at uh, you know in California. You know, despite money being available and, and him wanting to do that and, and this company formed to commercially uh, pursue mobile fusion. So, you know, either he didn't know something or his results weren't genuine. It's, uh, you know, the jury's out there. It's, so uh, what, what are the results that from his original work that you understood that inspired you? Well, I mean, I believe his uh, original results because I understood the uh, concept. So if you have a bubble and you drive it you know, hard enough, it will fuse. I mean, everybody 
agrees with that. So the demo is in the detail and precisely, uh, you know, the, 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 there are two things that will kill it or you know, more than two things, you know, one diffusion of gas in and out of bubble. So when you model collapse, you, you assume, well, amount of gas is the same, but it's not. So you, you gotta be able to control that and measure it to where when your bubble is huge, it's basically vacuum. So it's going to suck in, you know, vapor and contaminants. And when you collapse it, it's not the same bubble. So that's, you know, one thing you, you got to control and, and be mindful. And the other thing, you know, during the final stage of collapse, the bubble is no longer spherical. So it develops a jet. So all cavitation bubbles are that way. And you just hope that the jet is going to develop, you know, after, you know, your fusion already took place. And it's, uh, it's very difficult because you don't know how, you, how small your bubble gets because you cannot really model it. Uh, accurately, because uh, you know during the final stages of collapse, the time step is so small, and it's instability. You know, it's singularity. So a lot of assumptions. You know, you make a tiny assumption it has a huge, you know, effect on, on what's going to happen. So that's why, on one hand, I need to pursue modeling. On, on the other hand, I don't need to get too involved in modeling, be, because modeling and and experiment need to go hand in hand. You know, once you get some data, you want to make sure your model matches it. And then it becomes like a research project for an institute. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, way too difficult for one person. So my uh, approach is, well, how about luck will be on my side? You know, I try a bunch of stuff and, you know, maybe I detect something. So, so I mean, you're looking for effect by proxy by using the note neutrons as an expected outcome of the reaction. You're right, not, right. I can see you've not got any, you have no insulation on your device. There's no desire to look for temperature changes, which are obviously very- Right, I actually intend to, to run an experiment that will uh, look for you know, temperature sh change. It's just, you know, I didn't expect to be there, you know, just now. I thought, you know, first I'll detect a few neutrons, then I'll figure out, you know, how to control it. And once I'm able to control, I'll start measuring temperature. Uh, because initially, if it's just a handful of neutrons, you, know, you don't expect too much of thermal output. But I could be wrong about it because, you know, oil is also an excellent absorber of neutrons. You know, everybody knows that, you know, hydrogen, you know, just gobbles up <laughs> uh, neutrons and becomes deuterium. So it could be that, you know, there are a lot more neutrons that, that I know of. They just don't, you know, leave the reactor and maybe I get this... Uh, tritium build up now that's why i already ordered you know a tritium detector uh, I, I looked uh, into my headspace of the reactor with the residual gas analyzer uh, before i got neutrons you know i didn't see uh, tritium back then but you know gas analyzer is not necessarily as sensitive as a dedicated you know tritium detector would be and besides i need to look at it now you know once i started getting neutrons so you know but you're right, you know, I was primarily uh, looking at neutrons and I need to start looking at thermal component of it too. So uh, if, if you it's better. I've, it's, it, it, now what we're finding with um, uh, our uh, ultra experiments is that we're observing the production of carbon, uh, silicon and iron predominantly, uh, as well as other elements. Now I'm wondering, um, you're, you're not doing bubble fusion where you have a spherical chamber and you're trying to focus all the energy into the center spot. You're not trying to do star in a jar, are you? You're, you're right. looking more at what's happening with resonant modes in there, the nodes and anti-nodes. So it's, it's the yeah. same kind of work. So what I can suggest is obviously if you're using a hydrocarbon oil and you're adding in oxygen and deuterium and maybe other elements, those are the things you can't look for. But maybe you could look... I don't know how what the silicon content is of either the 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 components in there or the steel that you're using. But yeah, which go on. Actually reminds me of my earlier work that I've done when I had a big uh, machine, a you know, hundred horsepower cavitation machine that that had a rotor and stator. And when I cavitated heavy crude oil on that machine, you know, for the purposes of breaking it down. I was getting a lot of oxygen and nitrogen that was coming out of that cavitation process. It was blowing my mind. Like I would fill up the machine with oil that was in a purely hydrocarbon, mm -hmm. not even sulfur in it. And of course, you know, we did the analysis. So I knew what the composition of oil was. Mm -hmm. And the machine was evacuated and it was stopped off to where there was no hand space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after the machine runs, so it was just not even a closed loop. It was just a stator filled with oil, maybe like a, a gallon, a gallon of oil. 
uh, no headspace. So you seal it, you know, you run it. Of course, it gets very hot. And then it would start outgassing, outgassing like crazy. And if you put it in a pitcher, you know, bubbles would, it would go in a bubble like champagne. So we send it to analysis and they say, oh, it's uh, oxygen and nitrogen is coming out. So I thought, well, maybe somehow the machine is sucking in air, although it was unfathomable. So the machine was developing pressure on, on inside. So how would you suck atmospheric air against like the tremendous pressure inside? It just doesn't make sense, right? No, I, I, I've talked about this before. I think it's the CNO cycle. So you're just adding protons. Yeah, that's what I thought. Nice so just, just to make a clean experiment, you know, we built a, a box around the machine and we flooded it with argon. So mm -hmm. I thought if it sucks in air somehow through the seal on the shaft, and we would see that argon. But, you know, once we send samples so to analysis, it was still, you know, oxygen and, and carbon. Like, you know, what the no, hell? Oxygen and nitrogen, yeah. Yeah, oxygen and hydrogen, yes. So the, the thing about the CNO cycle, you should also see some helium production. Did you look for that? I don't think so. Uh, because, That's you know, when you put around analysis, you know, <laughs> they, 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 actually, I will, t I will take a look. Maybe I still have those reports saved. I, I remember I wrote like a paper about my observation. And so, well, this is what I got. I don't know what it means. But, you know, for posterity, now that you mentioned, yeah, I mean, if, 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 you've got a, if you've got a hydrocarbon, you have protons and you have carbon. And the, the, the CNO cycle uses uh, four protons, and it, uh, the carbon 12 acts as a catalyst and it goes around the cycle. And at the end, you end up with 12 carbon and you end up with yeah. one helium. Well, but in the process, you're synthesizing nitrogen and oxygen, which obviously are not part of the, the hydrocarbon. So they come out and off gas. Well, that helped me uh, let a little secret out. So that machine. You know, we made, made a, a copy of it back then. And the original machine was made out of the carbon steel, you know, just ordinary, you know, carbon steel. And the new machine that we made was exact copy, but made out of stainless steel, you know, so no rust. And the stainless machine never worked. Come again? Say that again? The stainless machine never worked. But the what machine did? The carbon steel machine did. Right. So somehow, you know, the composition of steel uh, was important. Well, this this leads me on to my second comment about your current work. So uh, I, I believe that the um, uh, either magnetic or paramagnetic elements play a very important role in all of these processes. And obviously, you may, because you're a native Russian speaker, you may be aware of a, a lot of the talk of uh, magnetic clusters, uh, strange radiation uh, is one, one name for them, that have this kind of mag magnetic behavior. Now, I, I was observing uh, uh, things that led me to believe that the iron core of uh, the Lion reactor, like this one here, um, was playing an important role in aggregating these clusters in the same way the iron clip clippings were aggregating these clusters in the radiation remediation of Yule Brown, which again is using water gas. This is very, very important. Um, and uh, he used aluminium. And so uh, I believe that the aluminium is preferentially taking the oxygen forming aluminium oxide. It leaves more protons available to the, the cluster, uh, which is forming on the iron. And then when it goes through the Curie point of iron, they get released, form a macro cluster, which captures the radioactive material, that does electronuclear collapse and instantaneously remediates the nuclear waste. And so what he observed uh, um, is, is a process which has a, an easy explanation when you understand uh, uh, what's going on. And I believe this is what's going on in ultra experiments. And I believe oxygen is very important. And I was going through the literature and one of the first data points for this was the work of Bokris and Sundaresan in uh, their um, carbon arc experiments. So they've got carbon and they've got them underwater. So they've got H2O and carbon, and they only got the synthesis of iron when they had dissolved oxygen in the water. They I only replicated got the... that experiment. Sorry? I actually replicated that experiment. And you saw the uh, production of iron? Oh, yeah, I saw production of magnetic particles. That's where I left. Okay. It. Yeah. Okay. So it, you didn't actually determine it to be iron. Now, the thing is, what they did is they degassed in a, a different way to you. They boiled the water. And they, in one case, they put nitrogen in. And in one, another case, they put oxygen in. And in the case of the nitrogen, they saw zero synthesis of iron whatsoever. No, none at all. Okay. Um, and in, in the, the uh, one where they have dissolved oxygen, 
uh, they saw the synthesis of iron. And this, this, got me, this got me thinking that the most important thing with cavitation, with HHO, with all forms of oxyhydrogen gases, the oxygen, and that's why I got excited when for the very first time in this live chat, I heard you mention you've got a very significant difference. Now, my hypothesis was this, that oxygen is incredibly paramagnetic. I don't know if you know, but if you get liquid oxygen, it will hold itself between a horseshoe magnet because it's so paramagnetic. And if you look at the, the paramagnetic nature of elements in the periodic table that are paramagnetic, not ferromagnetic, but paramagnetic, the, the, the oxygen is such an outlier. It's massively highly paramagnetic. And you have to go up into the lanthanides before you get uh, things that are equally as paramagnetic. OK, so I believe oxygen is so important. And this is encouraging because you talked about thunderstorms. And what do we have in the air? We have 20 something percent oxygen. So it can play the same role in ball lightning in the air as it's playing in Sundarason's experiment, as it's playing in the lion reactors, as it's playing in so many other things. The oxygen is important. It was water, yeah. heavy water that was in here. It wasn't deuterium. It was heavy water. So it had oxygen yeah. by default. So late Sturts had the same idea that oxygen was paramount. Sorry, who did? Late Sturts. He was uh, at Penn State and he worked with Randy Mills at some point. Okay, well, I, I, I think uh, we can safely concede that Bo Bokris and Sundarason found the importance of oxygen, but never gave a reason why. I believe it was because of the paramagnetic nature. And uh, I believe, uh, um, it, uh, so I'll come on to the fact that t obviously titanium is paramagnetic. Aluminium is paramagnetic. These elements that a lot of people are finding are very highly active in Lena, like, for instance, one of the most paramagnetic elements is tungsten. And so there are many elements um, that are uh, seem to be very active that are paramagnetic, but oxygen is incredibly paramagnetic. Now, the interesting thing, and I'm going to give you specific guidance for your experiment with this understanding. Oxygen gets much, much, much more paramagnetic the colder you make it. The colder you make it. The colder you make it, right? So if you've got oxygen gas down to liquid oxygen, it's much, much more paramagnetic. So rather than getting deuterium oxide, if you've got electro, and this is, so that there's one specific experiment that I'd like you to do. Get an oxygen bottle and get deuterium, and then just run the deuterium, run that, see your, your neutron counts, blah, 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 then add oxygen. Mm -hmm. and then control the amount of oxygen and then get a cryogenic cooler and cool your reactor and see if the neutrons go up. Okay, <laughs> thank you. As it gets much more paramagnetic, the cooler the, the oxygen is. So if it is that property. Now, when I was thinking about this, I, you know, you, you always think you're the first, but I've, I've learned a long time ago that pretty much everything you can ever think about, someone's already thought about it before. And so if you go, I think there's a paper by uh, uh, Leonid Aritzkev and uh, 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 another author, I think in 2003. And he says that the Chernobyl accident was because uh, the turbine uh, uh, reactor four was held and then it released. There was a huge amount of back EMF. This produced a lot of strange radiation that went into the dissolved oxygen in the water. And then all of the unexplained things blowing off the walls, all the metal blowing out, uh, was because of an entire intensely magnetic fluid running through. This uh, helped to trigger the reactor. And uh, the amount of strange radiation that was released, this, para this material that likes to bind to paramagnetic and ma magnetic things, bound to the, magnet the oxygen in the air above the reactor. And then as it was ionized by radio radiation, this caused this very bizarre glow, which you do not observe in normal nature, you get, it, it was a weird glow. It, and the reason is, is because the, the, the thing gets bound to the oxygen in the air, and this changes the, the spectrum from the energy levels of, of, of the oxygen. And so when it gets ionized, the frequency of light that comes out is different. And it's not something that a normal human would have experienced in life. Okay, so it would look like a weird glow. And there are thousands of people that give testimony well, me, to a weird glow. Let me mention something too. You know, when I was uh, starting with my cavitation machine, the 100 horsepower, I was running it on water and I was using PVC pipes because I could glue them easily. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that every time I was running the machine and water was circulating, I would sense the magnetic field present in PVC pipes. 
and it blew my mind. There you go. You, you, you've already got the data in your head. You see, um, I, I'm absolutely pretty much certain that this is what's going on with pretty much all of these systems. And, and I have to thank that, that Bokris and Sundresen for making that very clear. Okay, so um, adding the oxygen separately to your deuterium and cooling it would be my, my first uh, port of call. And, and that tests both the importance of oxygen. And you may find that adding more oxygen gives you more results than adding more deuterium, right? Uh, than adding more sound. It, you know, it might, might, might be that that is the parameter that's, that's really important because it was definitely the parameter that either allowed the production of iron or not allowed the production of iron in Sundres and, and Bokris's work. Um, now, if you come on to um, other detection methods, you can use an AM radio between uh, uh, stations. And he, if, if you can hear a crack, a pop, um, this is a, a cluster collapsing. So it's not a bubble collapsing, it's a cluster collapsing. Okay, so, and this produces a, a, a scalar wave, which only gets picked up, you, you can pick it up on an AM radio. Okay, mm -hmm. now you could wire up an AM radio so that you're capturing any spikes uh, and see if there's any incident spikes with any uh, or, or, or time correlated with a, with a phase offset uh, with any neutron production. So you, 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 could, you could see maybe, you know, when, when we're getting a lot, certain a large amounts of noise on the AM detector shortly afterwards or incident with it. Now, we've seen this with our um, residual air Vega experiments, uh, where we get these cluster explosions and uh, they produce these spherical columbic uh, uh, explosions, in my view, which cool the reactor. The reason they're cooling the reactor is when they went in, they, they condensed and they released heat on the way in. And when they explode, the electrons come back to their uh, uh, normal electron state. They, they then columbically ex uh, uh, explode, but they've lost thermal energy in, in the previous condensation project process, just like steam does to, uh, to uh, water does to, to ice. It has to go back, and so it has to grab thermal energy from the environment. This is cold electricity, and so. But the, when they return to normal electrons and they fly out, they are charged particles that are moving over a space, and so they produce the EMP. And so I, I would expect uh, it, when you've got it right, it, it, it would take some time, uh, um, but uh, may, maybe you could detect some cross, cross correlation. We we observe a flash on the video camera and in sync, we get uh, through a through a iron chamber, <laughs> we get a pulse uh, in sync with, with the AM radio. Um, so, you know, it's it's working in a bit of an odd way. Now, um, the, let me say, see what, well, I've got a list of things here. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about the two uh, titanium, uh, uh, sorry, titanium you added. Again, it is a known paramagnetic element. It has 22 electrons. It's very good for this process because of the uh, electron structure. Um, but uh, you, you go and see a presentation from a number of years ago called uh, Cab Story that we produced on, on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. When we were with um, uh, uh, Professor Francesco Piantelli in Italy in uh, January 2015, uh, he told us for the first time something which he was concerned about with people uh, when they are trying to replicate various lone genetic reaction experiments. And it was relating to his and uh, um, Ficardi's most energetic reactor, the one where they had to leave their lab for three weeks. Uh, it, it saturated all of their neutron detection uh, technology. It was the highest heat output by far. Um, and that is the rod that uh, there is a photo of uh, where it's, it's eaten a bit of area out and so on. He says that what was happening there is that these protons were coming out and he, he nailed it down to the steel choice that he was using contained vanadium 50, okay? And um, uh, vanadium 50, if you hit that with an energetic proton, it causes a reaction that produces neutrons uh, and it goes to 50 chromium, okay? And I've talked about this, but he never made that public. We didn't made it, make it public, but we did warn people about the st types of steel. We didn't make it public in, until we forced, we had to, because um, uh, we observed that uh, Suhas Raukar in India was using titanium and we observed 
uh, vanadium on his uh, titanium. And, uh, and also the same was with Mi-356 in Eastern Europe. He, he, we observed vanadium. Now there is some uh, um, spectrum crosstalk between the elements and we couldn't discount that, but given the, the observed uh, uh, risk from um, uh, Pian Telly's warning, we had to make that public. So you can go and see that presentation. And I specifically warned about using titanium with deuterium. The reason is this, is because titanium is mostly titanium isotope 48. And if you hit that with deuterium, you end up with producing vanadium 50. Now the vanadium 50 in vanadium containing steel is a very small percent of a small percent, but yet it produced lethal amounts of neutrons, okay? Uh, and the most heat that they ever uh, created from the traditional Foucardi and Pientelli reactor, okay, that's in, in the uh, peer-reviewed journals. Um, so the, the, this is why it was very interesting for me, and I was quite excited when you were telling me that this mystery you had, um, because you were seeing this offset neutron emission. And so what I would suggest is occurring there is you are synthesizing vanadium-50 and some residual protons that you have obviously in there because you have got a, a hydrocarbon oil is interacting and doing uh, this uh, proton vanadium-50 reaction, uh, which is then uh, producing this uh, 50 chromium decay with a to decay to uh, 50 chromium that's releasing a neutron. And this would be consistent with three other authors um, and, and uh, with the, the primary uh, person to have discovered this, uh, but not formally disclosed it, uh, being Francesco Piantelli. So I, I would suggest that you have a risk there. Now, um, you can, it, I don't know what your steel is in your vacuum units there. Maybe if you're not seeing these delayed neutrons, it's not important. Maybe you don't have a steel that contains vanadium or, or there isn't enough of this going on on the interaction between the surface of the reactor and, and, and the fluid uh, uh, deuterium laden, laden uh, com composite. Um, and you, you can might, find- uh, that. be curious to know that naturally produced crude oil has significant vanadium in it. Okay, all right. Well, if it's got, uh, I, the, the risk, the risk then would be cavitation and you would you're producing neutrons and neutrons then would would produce other isotope if you, uh, you add a neutron into carbon you've had enough neutrons into carbon you're going to get production of uh, nitrogen i guess but doesn't it like seem strange that the oil that comes out of the ground you know has vanadium contaminants in it uh well um yeah i mean uh, i have to think on that for a few seconds i've got some more people want to come in here um but uh yeah hi david um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, let me, let me think on that. I haven't got anything immediate to say on that, but I, I imagine, um, uh, it would be playing a role in your experiments that you were observing these, uh, uh, neutrons, so this uh, nitrogen and oxygen synthesis. Um, so yeah, and, and, and you mentioned early on about the thunderstorms and I, I would suggest that, uh, the thunderstorms are doing the same thing with the oxygen and, uh, about the cavitation uh, collapse bubble size and the energy uh, imparted in that, I would recommend you go and look at whichever, I, th I think it's um, it's either a Taiwanese, I think it's a Taiwanese group that did this. Uh, it might be at the Taipei Energy University under Bin Jirin Huang, uh, uh, where they were looking at the different bubble sizes, but it might've been another group. I don't know, you'll have to go and look at, uh, it might be in a Chinese group. But anyway, go, go and have a look at the presentations there because they actually, uh, work out the energy that's being produced uh, in the, the intensity of the energy. And they said the smaller the bubble, the better it is for producing the intensity uh, of the energy. And that, that's what you want. And also if the bubble, as you say, the, the bigger the bubble gets, the more likely you have with other statistical variation in there for it to become unstable before it has a symmetrical collapse. And you want to target towards a, a symmetrical collapse. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I think everything that you've observed lines up um, it's very, very, it's, it's, it's just literally wonderful to listen to you and you. Say, say things that, that, that make, don't, don't really make sense, and, and, but they make absolute perfect sense. They make absolute perfect sense. So for, for me, the, the most wonderful things you've said in this uh, uh, presentation are, for me, uh, yes, you had a, a step change in your neutron output. And for me, it's like, well, I know what that is it, as, far, as far as I'm, I'm where I'm coming from and that there are actionable things that you can take on that. 
and also with the titanium. Now, uh, what else could you do? Well, um, I looked at other elements and I uh, came across the fact that um, when I was studying in 2017 and observed my first strange radiation coming out of uh, ultrasonically cavitated titanium and carbon uh, 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 and potassium in Suhas Ralkar's fuel maker. And bearing in mind, he was only doing this to mill off the shelf particles down to five microns. He wasn't trying to do anything else but mill these particles that he could get cheaply in India and make particles that were resonant for his reactor because he thought it was the sound resonance in the reactor that was the important thing. Uh, anyway, so I observed this uh, ra radiation uh, coming out of, of, of his um, uh, uh, material, and we observed it on uh, 10 by 7 photographic plates. We observed it on plastic, both in contact and not in contact. Uh, and uh, at one point I thought, well, can we use a webcam using a piece of software called a uh, cosmic ray finder. And I work actually with the Russian author to uh, tweak that software, but you can download it, it's for free. And uh, uh, I didn't have anything to um, cover the camera. In fact, it's this camera here, uh, this camera here. It's a Logitech 910C uh, there. And uh, I needed something to mask out that. And I just looked around my lab and I found a load of plumbers uh, polytetrafluoroethylene uh, uh, tape and I just wrapped it round, you know, until I couldn't see no light at all because I'm looking for particles that are coming through. That's what I had. That's what I had. So that's what I used. And I caught some traces. And in fact, one of the traces uh, was the exact same um, zigzag as the strange radiation track we observed on the Lion 1 core. And exact match, same scale and everything. And so this isn't a three, bo three body interaction. This is something that's been able to travel through the air, go through 20, 30 layers of PTFE tape through the plastic at the front of that, through the IR filter and go in and, and interact with the sensor. So we knew that this, this, this was a strange radiation track, but there's some work that was done by um, uh, uh, an American uh, researcher. Uh, his name's gonna come to me in a minute, but he was looking at uh, something emitted from uh, hyd hydrogen uh, loaded metals and, um, uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember his name now. And he, he worked at Los Alamos for a period on a nuclear engine, but you might be able to remember his name with that clue before I do. But anyway, um, Ed, Edmund Storms. Okay, so, and I think he worked with Brian Scanlan or uh, anyway, it was Ed, Edmund Storms. And they observed some radiation that was coming out of their reactor. It was going through the water. It was going through polymer. It was going through aluminium. It was going through steel. And it was interacting with their um, Geiger counter. Now, the interesting thing was when they turned the reactor off, it was still occurring and it had a decay. And the decay was the decay of, uh, I think, uh, oxygen 18, which is very specific. And he didn't realize because he observed iron in his mica, but his, the iron uh, as, as a cross band uh, um, relationship with fluorine. And I found that all mica contains fluorine. And then I found that fluorine is paramagnetic. Okay, it's the nucleus. It's got an NMR moment on, on the nucleus. So I'm thinking, is fluorine a fuel? Is fluorine interact with this radiation? And then maybe that's why this was excited when it went through there. And then when I was reporting these results at ICC, at, at um, Sochi in 2018, there was a slide there by Alexander Shishkin where he was talking about the sadly departed in that year, uh, Yurji Bajatov, uh, who said to shield from, he called it Erzion radiation, but let's call it whatever it is, something coming out of his discharges, uh, water surface discharges, you either use uh, a, a, um, a boron glass up to two centimeters, or, or you used fluorocarbon, polymer sheets. So we have a cross correlation between the interaction with fluorine and so on. So when I was doing the, uh, the brown, uh, sorry, the HHO, the, the Amasa gas with um, uh, 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 titanium, on titanium, Amasa gas on titanium, and then touching that, I, I, I said, have you got any PTFE sheeting? And that is when we got uh, 
absolutely textbook, according to Solin's 1992 patent, quantum coherent nuclear reaction, instantaneous, an explosive event. And we had carbon and fluorine in there, carbon and fluorine. So I'm coming to the, the money, money shot here. And this is that um, I was talking to this to uh, um, uh, Alexander Parkamov, and he did a series of experiments over the last year and a bit where he had a strange radiation generator in his view. Uh, uh, he thinks it's just cold neutrinos. Shishkin would say it's cold neutrino condensates, electrons and, and ions, but anyway, whatever. Something coming out and he's using an overdriven halogen light bulb. And then he used different materials next to uh, this reactor and found that the one that produced the most excess heat was lithium fluoride. So I have another thing for you to do. Get some lithium fluoride, dissolve it in your heavy water and add that to the reactor and run. <laughs> Just run away. <laughs> because because the, the reaction that I calculated was working uh, in, in the um, Edmund Storms thing, which he didn't identify. The, the, the decay is 18 oxygen. But if you get potassium 39, which is a fermion, and you get lit at 19 fluorine, and it's in many uh, micas, it's, it's potassium fluoride, KF is one of the principal molecules in, in the mica. You do, a new you do an exchange reaction in there and you end up with two uh, bosons uh, and so on. But the point is you end up with the, the, the decay that he observed, um, uh, which was offset from the reactor operating. I'm gonna add someone in here again. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, um, and so on. So, so yes. So that, that would be my next thing for you to look to do, adding lithium fluoride. In fact, we have, and this isn't published yet, but we, we have added fluorite just, just from, a, from a crystalline gem shop to our Vega experiments working in this direction. And David Booty is on that line. So may, maybe now understands my full argument for, for, for adding a fluorine con containing compound um, to uh, the uh, reactor uh, that, that we've done in, done in, done uh, last year. Um, uh, so it was interesting. We weren't looking for excess heat or, or, or whatever. I was looking for something that would interact with the strange radiation in interesting ways. And in fact, uh, the fluorite in our experiments just exploded. <laughs> now, why is it exploding? I don't know. But we do know that when you take titanium, you load it up with the hydrogen clusters from the Amasa gas and you put it onto PTFE, it exploded extremely violently. Um, uh, so this is what I'm saying, run. When you turn on your experiment, run, because it might be deeply unpleasant what happens. So I'm giving you this based on a whole series of experience and experiments spanning a long period of time, right the way up to just a few weeks ago with Parkmore's findings, where lithium fluoride produced the biggest result. Now, the idea is that the, the lithium, obviously, uh, it's a light element. Fluorine's pretty light. There are, if you go to uh, um, uh, lenacana.org, there are other people in history uh, of Lena that have proposed fluorine as a good Lena fuel. But it's what is, is it the fuel itself? I don't believe it is. You, you need to create the active structures. So in your reactor, I don't expect that it would instantaneously, although it's very quick with, with cavitation, it's, it is nearly instantaneously. But in most people's experiments, they need to build the active structures with, it, with whatever method they're using. And then the active structures can then interact with material that they need to fuse or fission, okay? And um, uh, it's these clusters, whatever they are. And, and uh, the thing is cavitation just does it almost instantaneously. So you don't have to worry about that delay time. I mean, we're getting transmutation in, um, uh, what do you call it, in like, uh, I don't know, 90 seconds or something in the, in the cavitators we're doing. We're observable, but they are in there. Now, there's another thing. I don't know whether you can do this, but is there some way that you can introduce into the chamber a witness foil? And I would specifically suggest aluminium. Uh, you would need foil? A, a witness foil. Yeah, but which one? I would suggest, uh, okay, so the reason for using copper is it doesn't really like to absorb uh, hydrogen, but it's very conductive, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and Matsumoto is saying he chose copper for that reason, is that you get on the surface 
uh, a, a lot of protons. So you get the, the, the proton clusters forming. Um, we've observed very good results by using uh, on the cathode in experiment, um, uh, in Vega experiments, uh, copper tubes. And we get the observed experimental uh, outcomes that were observed by Matsumoto. But uh, uh, aluminium for me is a better fuel because it's a single isotope. So, it, and it's paramagnetic. Uh, and uh, so it, obviously it will oxidize a lot, but what I would look for is that you would need something in your chamber that was able to fix the aluminium witness material in a fixed point in the chamber, okay? And uh, then you, you would look, uh, uh, the aluminium foil, you couldn't use aluminium like we use, which is like, you know, this, this stuff, it's ki kitchen foil because your experiment, you've got so much energy in there, it will be fragments in, a, in about two right. seconds, right? So you, you might need to do what uh, Bin Jiren Huang did. He did it with copper and he observed these same kind of yin yangs um, but he, he wasn't holding the thing in place. The important thing is to hold it in place. Why? Because when you get the resonant nodes and anti-nodes, you get the transmutation at the center point. And so you don't have to look at the rest of the foil. You just see where you get your yin-yang and you look at the center point. And then I would try it with light water and I would tie it with heavy water and see if you have a higher level of transmutation at the center points of the yin-yangs uh, in one or other. Because what you're doing, I believe, will work with light water. And so th this is my next thing that I'd suggest to you is to use, add light water, because I believe the oxygen is the important bit. You can make the clusters with heavy or light water. It's slightly, it's because it's not bosonic, the, the proton, it's not bosonic. It's harder to, to make the bosonic cluster, uh, but it will work. This has already been shown by Matsumoto, but he used uh, uh, electrical uh, you know, discharges. So I, I would suggest using uh, 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 light water as well. And I know it seems a bit counterintuitive. So we have oxygen on its own to add with your deuterium. So you can change that. Cooling the oxygen, uh, adding lithium fluoride. Um, uh, uh, I, I would worry about your titanium results uh, because of the history, history of, of the production of vanadium 50. You could, you could consider adding vanadium. Um, I don't know, but I think titanium is better because you, the vanadium 50 is quite a, a, a much lower concentration in vanadium than there is titanium 48. There's a very high proportion of titanium 48 in titanium. It's mo most of the uh, uh, element isotopes. So I, I think probably that's that's what I have for you at the moment. And I, and I have to congratulate you for persisting. I mean, you've been on a quite long journey now. And yeah. uh, where, where do you want to take it? You said you, you mentioned that you, you have some things in your paper that you've produced. Uh, yeah, wanted. basically, uh, you know, I've outlined in that report uh, the things I do, I need to do next in order to be able to submit a paper to a peer review journal. And, uh, you know, a control experiment with light water is uh, among them, you know, capturing X ray and gamma spectrum too. And of course, I want to do a clean repetition where, you know, I put fresh oil, you know, fresh deuterium and can get the same result. And I think then uh, I can send a report and say, hey, and if I cavitate, I get neutrons. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> it's something for me to study. At least, you know, here is the fact. And over, the, over this year, I intend to drill down to the bottom of this and figure out the physics of the process. That would be my you know, lofty expectation to where I could write, you know, the next paper and say, well, this is the experiment that you know already reported on, and this is, I think, the physics, and, and this is why. And present some experimental evidence that would either confirm that these are fusion neutrons that I see tritium, and if I measure neutron spectrum, you know, I see the energies that match the deuterium deuterium fusion, or if this is a spallation or something else, you know, present evidence, you know, to that end. Okay. Well, um, and and. Uh, so uh, obviously keep your distance from it. <laughs> I'm, I'm very serious because you are observing neutrons, but that, it, it, are they real neutrons? I, I think they are, but I need to grab a power cord, Mike. Uh, okay, okay. Is going to that. Just I'm, I'm just going to check my phone, still going to be able to broadcast. <laughs> So if anyone's got any questions for Max or myself, um, please uh, 
put raise your hand. So down the bottom of uh, Zoom, there is a thing called reactions. If you wave your mouse over it and you click on that and you can go raise hands. So I know that you want to ask some questions. Uh, I'm hoping that I will be able to get a download of the recording here and I will post this to YouTube, uh, to the MFMP channel for people to review afterwards. Right, so to, to answer your question, you know, the, if these are real neutrons. I realize the importance of a secondary means of confirmation. So that's something I also outlined in my report that I ideally should be able to put an indium foil inside the reactor and activate it and measure ah, it. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, so I added indium uh, to the cavitation of uh, Suhat Ralka and we've done cavitation on indium. Indium is mostly a beta isotope. And if it's interacting with strange radiation, the, the reason that I was going to use indium is it was the softest metal that wouldn't react with water uh, that has a large amount of beta isotope in it. And the idea is that this would uh, transmute uh, uh, very readily. Well, I only exposed it to 10 minutes of 179 Hertz cavitator in, in uh, um, the Amasa vibrators. And it basically came out very, very hard. And it has the uh, Matsumoto ring spots all over it and, and so forth. So I don't know, um, you know, it, it's got all kinds of elements going on in there. So I don't know whether it was transportation. So I wouldn't put it in the, the water because it's just, it's going to end up like nothing you can see. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, I don't know. And it's, outside the reactor, I, mean, I can use it outside. I, I, I would put it out if it's, it, and, and then you, you need to, you know, you need two pancake detectors uh, on, on either side. So it, indium's the obvious choice um, uh, for that. Do you know that, yeah, obviously that works for all kinds of spectrum. Do you know the energy level of, because you're good at this. You, no, you, I, need, I need to boost the, uh, the, you know, one of my uh, main objectives is to increase the neutron counts to where I can get, you know, this thousand CPM consistently, because then uh, I might have enough neutrons to start looking into their energy, because it was just, you know, a few of them per minute, you're just not going to be able to resolve the energy spectrum, because the cross section of interaction is so low, you need a significant flux to measure energy. So that's on my to-do list also. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I have published this and I, I'm going to publish a little bit more data on this, but Shishkin, you can read it in Russian if you go and look at his Trinitas uh, publications. He talks about biasing a normal uh, boron 10 tube um, with a, is it boron 10 or a boron, boron 10? Um, uh, with a, uh, a different normal, normal bias. I think it's minus 400 volts or something rather than 50 volts or so, something like that. But what, what he gets is, he can determine the difference between uh, normal neutrons and uh, these uh, clusters, which he calls string vortex solitons, uh, because it produces a 50 times bigger drop in, in signal. Uh, and it's, it's a very distinct signal. So it will appear like a normal neutron, but if you do what he's done, it appears as something that a normal neutron will not do. So this would give you an idea of whether you are observing real neutrons or something that is is presenting okay. i'll check it out sure. yeah okay so i i did a little video on that there's a little uh, graph so um just look position on uh, on uh, remote uh, on um okay. the mfmp youtube channel but uh, okay. I, I think i'm gonna i'm gonna translate but you can speak russian anyway so it's not important um you go and look at his work on, on trinitas if you don't know i'll give you the link okay. uh, later in the week um, but he's he's quite uh, uh, amenable, so you might be able to speak to him directly. Um, okay. So uh, in Thanks. your Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I think, but certainly before you want to publish, you want to be able to say uh, whether it is neutrons or whether it's something. I suspect you're seeing real neutrons from the titanium deuterium. I think that is. Re I think that's this knock-on reaction to 50 chromium. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to be able to detect a a, a detectable amount of chromium in there. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just not going to be enough reactions. You'd have to run it for a very, very long time to right, right, detect right. enough chromiums. But you, you could look at the energy of that neutron that comes out, maybe, with the titanium and see if you are seeing that energy of neutron when you have titanium in there. So that might be a very specific thing that you can look for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. The other one I'd say is look for iron, but you're, you're in a steel chamber anyway. But specifically, I'd say look for iron spherical 
uh, crenellated uh, structures that are probably in the range of 10 to 30 microns. And they will, they'll li literally look like a brain and uh, they will be iron and oxygen. Mm -hmm. So when you run an experiment for a long time, and this is with experiments that contain water, whether that's from light water, heavy water, or, or separate gases, I would then look for the synthesis of these crenelated iron microspheres. And you could probably do that easiest by running a, a neodymium magnet that's in a balloon so that you know it, it doesn't go straight onto the magnet because you can't get them off. <laughs> uh, run it around in the, the oil after it's settled and see if you can pick up any particles. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I'll try that. If you see that, then we can produce these things in about 460 seconds in a, a, a cavitator, domestic cavitator. We've seen them in ball lightning, in Hestal and ball lightning. When a ball lightning has hit the ground, they've observed them in the soil. Uh, we've observed them uh, in uh, the ultrasonic uh, air containing, i.e. therefore it has water and oxygen, uh, um, NOVA experiments, uh, like, like ball lightning inside a, a microwave reactor. And we've observed them in, um, uh, what's the other one? Oh dear, uh, in the Vega experiments. So on, on this thing behind me here, there are two spheres. They're both 27 microns and they're both exactly these structures. And so I believe they're on the magnetic core of, of ball lightning. And so uh, you, it's a macro electron cluster, electronucleus cluster. So I, I, would, I would see if you can find those. And if you've got synthesis of iron and you only get it when you have oxygen in there, either from a water source or from added oxygen, then you know you're creating a similar thing to what happens with ball lightning in the air. Um, and uh, you, you're in that family. I'm not saying you will see it, but I suspect you will. I suspect you will. Okay. I, I predicted it with the ultrasonic experiments and like two days later they were found in abundance. And so it's, it's becoming a bit joke now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see so has anyone got any questions so so, uh, uh, so I've got David Boutlier saying please be careful strange radiation I use shielding for Vega but I have no idea of its effectiveness now so as I said earlier um, uh, usually Bajatov suggested uh, two uh, centimeters of boron, boron glass you're using uh, uh, borax which is a domestic uh, uh, cleaning product uh, available. yeah so that that that's your your solution there but also um uh that's more for new, normal neutrons uh but whether that works i don't know uh with with strange radiation but uh, i have this sheet i'll go and get it from the other room so i have this sheet here and this is a one by one meter sheet of uh, polystyrene and then I have alternate layers seven on both sides of aluminium foil and cellophane and then I have a uh, plate down here which has washers uh, going through it and it's connecting to each one and you do a I think it's a high voltage negative on here uh, so it captures it and then I have to go on the back of this um, some uh, magnet vinyl okay so the, the magnet vinyl is to pull the strange radiation towards it um, and capture it. If it gets through all of these layers, if it gets through all of the seven layers with the charge on it, uh, then it, it doesn't come through the, the magnet at the back because that will capture it as well. And we know this uh, should work from the work of uh, um, uh, uh, Leonid Oretzke mm -hmm. because he used... 0.7 a meter away from his exploding foils in water. Um, and they were titanium foils, by the way, in water. <laughs> Not always, but it was. Um, he had a normal magnet on the backside of some iron 57 sheet. And he observed the fine constant moving one way or other, depending on whether it had a north on there or a south on there. So he observed these structures. So that's the basis. If it, if it makes it through here, because typically these things, when they come into a surface, like particularly like aluminium, they will come in and they will then orient themselves so, so their own pole is, is perpendicular to the surface and then will run along the surface producing the strange radiation track. So the idea is you have lots and lots of thin sheets here. And so the reason that you have a insulator conductor, insulator conductor, is that the, the, it doesn't like to go um, through 
impedance changes. So that is off uh, Shoulder's work. And uh, Shishkin and his colleagues believe that multiple thin layers are, are what does it. We know it interacts with aluminium from uh, the work of John Hutchison, preferentially. It's highly, it interacts with this very, very well uh, at, on a surface level. So it somehow catches it. And I believe that's to do partly with the conductivity and partly with the uh, fact that it's always got oxygen on the surface, so it can bind to the oxygen. And also it's uh, uh, paramagnetic. There's three major reasons why it should go into the oxygen, uh, sorry, into the aluminium. And so I've got 14 chances of it being caught here just on the aluminium. <laughs> then I've got the cellophane, then I've got the charge and then behind. So that's, that's as best as I can suggest it. So if you are increasing the chance of you getting this uh, uh, radiation in your, your lab by potent potentially adding lithium fluoride, uh, and David said, uh, David is saying, I put lead plate on mine after the magnet layer. Well, yes, I know uh, that might sound like a good idea if you're actually creating, um, uh, uh, I don't know, I, if you're actually creating X-ray radiation from that. So th there is some work by, um, uh, by uh, I'm going to remember his name in a minute. He runs the Atom Ecology blog. I can't remember his name, but there's a clue for you. Um, he did some work where he had an experiment uh, and he wasn't observing any radiation, but he then put silver in the way, and then he observed radiation behind the silver. And so something was interacting with the silver and then uh, producing radiation. Uh, uh, and so, um, in fact, that's actually why the lion author ended up by putting silver on the, 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 this end of the reactor, is a conversion uh, for whatever came out. And um, I, I think it was Edward Teller called these things machinigons. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, like because they were old things that came out of the reactor that interacted with other materials. So, um, yeah. So, has anyone got any questions? Because um, I, okay. So, do you want to run the experiment as a as a as a finale here? Then I really can't without deuterium. I mean, the best what you saw was the uh, sound. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can keep that sound to yourself. <laughs> Might be a good idea to do a live uh, demonstration once the deuterium bottom bottle that, arrives. And that would that would be fantastic. So uh, I, I guess then, um, if if no one else has anything to ask, uh, we can probably stop the recording. Is there anything else you want to add? That's it. You know, I think uh, we had a good good conversation. Do, do, do you need any funding right now? Uh, do you need any help? Yeah, I, mean, I could use help with a few things. Uh, I really would like uh, to get somebody to work with me on modeling. So I have this, you know, Heidi's software. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could use a person who could work with me on at least getting some data out of it on the, uh, you know, collapsing bubble. And I can uh, show them, you know, what needs to be done. And in the long run, of course, I would like to write my own hydrodynamic simulation that would include all of the physics that I need. So yeah, I'm looking for, you know, a PhD type, you know, person who would work on a simulation with me, be that uh, high IDs or, you know, custom software package that we could develop together. So that this would be some e extended project, you know, that we can work on. Uh, and produce publishable results, you know, regardless of the fusion outcome. And, uh, you know, I could use a software developer. It's kind of, you know, I, I taught software engineering, you know, for many years, but as I grow older, it, it becomes harder and harder for me to develop software myself, just taking e extraordinary amount of time. So I could use a C++ software developer, you know, that I could use, you know, on and off you know, to help me <laughs> improve. Uh, you're, you're, you're more uh, after. It, you're more after actual uh, intellectual help rather than than financial assistance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I could use yeah intellectual help more than financial assistance. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, yeah. uh, Max, if somebody if, wants to donate towards the research, you know, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> well, if if you have something specific, let let us know because. Uh, uh, oh yeah, I, you know something specific, and you know, it's not not so much you know money. Uh, I could really uh, use an opportunity to borrow a calibrated calibration nutrient source. I'm using, you know, makeshift. In a you and everyone else. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you can buy one. 
but in order to buy one, you have to get a license. And in order to get a license, you know, I have to rent space. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing this at home uh, and I can buy a new you know, calibrated source, but as I said, I'll have to rent space and I have to apply for a license and then NRC would have to come in and conduct an inspection. And all of that is doable, but it's a next level of expense, you know, I have to have space. Yeah. So, but it would be useful to, to have a calibration source, like for a couple of days, just I'll put it inside the reactor and see what kind of flux I'm going to get. So I could relate, you know, the counts that I, that I get on my detectors to to the actual, you know, neutron flux. Well, I think before you need to do that, you do need to determine whether they're real neutrons. Right, right. But, so, you know, these are the things that, that come to mind straight away. Um, I, I, it's it's not just uh, Ed Storms that's observed this. Uh, I, I think uh, Stanislav SPAC and also I think Preparata. I don't know, many people observed these 120 kilo electron volt sort of signals coming out and they thought that maybe, so how can they get out of the reactor because they're higher than any K-shell electrons uh, uh, would produce, the X-rays would produce from that. Uh, and and there's, a, there's an interview by, uh, um, uh, of Martin Fleischmann with uh, Christopher B. Tinsley in 1996, talking about this problem that they've observed is, weird energetic re radiation coming out and somehow it's coming through the reactor. So it, it kind of, is it neutral? Is it coherent? And he actually, Martin Fleischmann says, is this coherent X-rays? Um, which is a very interesting thing for him to say. I would actually suggest uh, doing exactly what Ed Storms did and getting a mica, pot uh, potentially one uh, that has this KF, uh, potassium fluoride, uh, uh, molecule in the mica structure. I think, I don't know whether it's lipidolite. Lipidolite's got lithium in it, um, but uh, muscovite, I think that might be probably the best to, to use. Um, and, and a lot of, lot of the, the, the Geiger molecules, they have a musco, muscovite window. Um, or you can add that on, of course, and then see if you see this decay that was observed by, um, uh, um, by uh, Edmund Storms. If you do, then, it's not normal neutron. Okay. Got it. Else. So you've got two, two, two ways to potentially go there. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I'd like everyone to uh, put on their cameras if they can. And I'll, I'll, I'll pull thank up you. your window and we'll capture a picture of you clapping. So thank you very, very much to Dr. Max Formachev Zamalot for his uh, detailed explanation there. And uh, thank you for taking questions uh, from myself and, uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing of your next success, which hopefully okay. isn't too many neutrons that you can't report it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'll be the first to know. All right, <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, Max. Thanks guys for tuning in. It's been a real pleasure. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>